Good morning. Sure is good to be here in more ways than one. I'll tell you, Lord, it's good. I'm uh, so thankful. I want to thank you first. Express my deep, heartfelt gratitude for all the prayers you've given me. Absolutely phenomenal. God's done a work. It's since last January, the end of January, for about the last whew, two, two and a half months, have been something else. I have had, uh, you know, overcoming this double pneumonia in my lungs, and it's something. I, I mean, you know, God's restored. He's still in the process of restoring all of us, but I mean, I got a couple of more tests to do. Not through it yet, but I'm not on oxygen anymore. Grateful to God and thanks to you and your prayers because he's heard. I mean, you know, this uh, already had a compromised lung from, from uh, when I went to Malaysia so many years ago and, it, and got a bad disease and nearly died from that. But it's amazing. So God's good and he does and restore in his good time. And when we think we're out for the count, he says, no, 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 not yet. I got more for you to do. And uh, I give him the glory today and thank him for every day that we have, life and breath. And I know you do as well. Today we're going to look a lot of scripture, particularly in Psalm 53. If you want to turn there, we'll be looking at that. And Psalm 46, uh, biblical examples that have to do with the paralyzing grip of fear, overcoming that. Scriptures and examples from God's word that keep you from falling apart. And most, most of these things you already know. You know as believers. But, and I, and I, but it's important that we're reminded of it again, I believe. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, Father, I thank you for bringing us in here today. And I humbly ask that, that you give me your wisdom to teach this, this lesson this morning. And be led by your spirit. I do pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, living in fear is paralyzing. Absolutely. And I've seen it in people. Uh, they become so gripped by fear of whatever's happening around them or in their own lives that uh, they can hardly even function as a human being anymore. Uh, the Lord clearly promises to cover his own people, to walk with them through the flood and the fires. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And the Lord Jesus reminded us in his word, in the word of John 10, 28, that the child of God, we are safe in his hands. Nothing can pluck us out, not a thing. He said, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I mean, that's a double, a double protection right there. The Father and the Son of God. God's given us testimonies in his word and the witness of scripture that drives away this grip of fear. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So if that's so, then why are so many of God's people still feeling the effects of fear today? It's happening. It's as if what the psalmist said in verse 5 there in, in Psalm 53, there were they in great fear where no fear was. So look with me. The very first statement, psalm, David says, the writer of this psalm, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. This is an incredible statement. Think about it. It's more complex than it appears on the surface. When you're thinking on this verse, you know, you first probably thought, well, this is talking about a person who, who doesn't believe in the existence of God. Yes, rightly so. But ironically, this, 
this person argues that the very God who gave him the ability to reason and even breathe the breath of life doesn't even exist. Are you kidding me? That doesn't make any sense, does it? According to Romans 1, we know what it says there in Romans 1.20. There's a declaration in nature itself that points to the existence of God. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the, this eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This means that everybody one day, everybody is going to stand before the Lord God Almighty without excuse. Listen, people of every nation, every culture, every nationality, every language is, has the opportunity to know that there's a sovereign God of the universe who created the heavens and the earth through the witness of the heavens themselves by the very majesty and the clockwork of how everything is put together. That's God. And yet in the middle of this, men and women who've been, giving, been given the breath of life by God are still saying there's no God. The tragedy of such fools one day, they'll stand before the throne of God and finally for a brief moment, they're going to see and understand the love of the one who created them only for a moment, love so immeasurable, so fantastic, so pure, so beyond anything that any of us can ever imagine, only be cast out of his presence forever in eternity, into eternal darkness and hell for rejecting the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. I think of the person who mentally fashions a God for himself. You know, they mold a God who won't hold him account of anything he does wrong, refusing to believe there's a God who has the right to even govern his life. We see that all around us today, don't we? Sure. How people desire and try to create their own God. We're told of it while Moses was going up on the mountain meeting with the Lord and preparing to bring the truth and the revelation of God to the Israelite nation. I mean, they had been led supernaturally. They saw God at work out of the land of Egypt from bondage and how they so quickly forgot. We see how they became impatient and they insisted that Aaron make a God to go before him. And so Aaron, he collected gold earrings and all kinds of gold junk he could find. Mm. And the people saw it and they reacted. He made it, Bolt made a cow. In Exodus 32, we see it, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Can you believe it? Oh, my. Listen, there's something in the heart of man that wants to form his own God, the kind of God he'd like to serve. The thing is, God has a standard of right and wrong, doesn't he? He sure does. And every one of us who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ knows that. And we accept that. We embrace that truth because he's changed us. I mean, as born-again believers, we want to be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not try to mold God to fit our image of what we think he ought to be. This Bible tells us who he is. And all of those who are in Christ, we take hold of that truth. We take hold of those changes that God brought into our lives. We, it, it gives me great heartfelt gratitude, doesn't it you? It does me. I mean, we see the change in our own lives and the lives of other believers all around us. Uh, I mean, all those that are in Christ, we take hold of it. And we see people who at one time, maybe they were thieves, but no longer. They work and make an honest living. Some are liars, used to be, and they speak the truth now, the truth of God, and maybe the unmerciful. Now they find mercy, and they extend it to others. Selfish people become compassionate folk. What happened to them? They've been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit within them. 
and being changed into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ who lives within them. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A changed life is irrefutable evidence that a person's been born again by the Spirit of God. If there's no change, if a person continually tries to make God fit his image of who he thinks God is to be, then he's deceived. I mean, he's living in la-la land, as Preacher Lawson says all the time. And a fool's paradise, no true salvation. Look what David wrote in verse 2 there. Look down, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. It's, just as, it's as if the Lord was looking down on earth asking, well, who's willing to hunger after me, to really know me? Who's willing to be conformed to my image? Who's willing to believe my word rather than bound down to fear or anything else in this evil generation? In the life of David, we find an example of somebody the writer of this psalm was somebody who was willing to believe God in the face of overwhelming odds. Look at verse 5. Could it be that David was looking back in retrospect when he wrote this verse? Maybe, I don't know. But look at it. Let's read it. There were they in great fear where no fear was, for God had scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame because God hath despised them. Maybe David remembered the day he walked into the camp of the Israelites, that army as a young boy, he walked into the camp of the Israelite army, a young boy carrying a, a little bread and cheese. His father sent him out to check on his brothers there. And it was at that time that the Philistine army, they were encamped against Israel on the far side of the great valley. And every morning, every evening, for 40 days, a giant named Goliath stood by to challenge, and he stood up and challenged the, the army of Israel. Now, over in 1 Samuel 17, we read what Goliath said. He said, He stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and you serve us. King Saul and all the armies, there they were, just stood around trembling in fear. Fear, unable to fight. There wasn't any battle. I wonder how often that the old devil does the same thing to us. Roaring across the valley, straight into our lives, leaving us trembling trembling, fearful. Yet this time with Goliath standing before him, it was the people of God who were trembling. David described them in Psalm 53, 5 as being in great fear where no fear was. Now picture this young boy. Here's David suddenly coming into the camp, leading a donkey, which carrying some bread and cheese. Nobody could ever imagine that this could be God's answer to the problem and difficulty, yet young David was somehow, he knew God. He walked with God. And so straight into the middle of the camp, he went cheerfully greeting his brothers. I imagine he was met with words by his brothers, you know, thanks kid, head on home. Now get to the house before you hurt yourself. Mm. And when David heard the threats of Goliath, he essentially said, well, why is everybody afraid? What's going on here? This harsh, arrogant, loud mouth, noisy giants attacking the integrity of God. Doesn't anybody see this? Is there not a cause? You know the story. The Israelites became annoyed with David. Why? Because he was actually exposing their bankrupt spirituality. Imagine all the soldiers. Here they were, suited up in their armor. Mm. Full armor, helmets, swords. They had it all and they were convicted at the core at this young boy who boldly announced, I'm going to go fight him. They said, oh, are you kidding? And, and we read in Samuel where David's older brother, Eliab, he accused him. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why comest thou down hither? In other words, why would you come down here? And with whom thou hast left those few sheep in the wilderness? 
Hmm, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. What battle? <laughs> there wasn't any battle going on. You remember Eliab. Eliab was the oldest of Jesse's sons, the one that Samuel at first thought was going to be the Lord's anointed. Remember that? Until God reminded him not to judge by appearance, but by what? The heart, right? Yes, and now we see Eliab accusing David of the very thing that made him ineffective in the battle. Listen, those, those who have stopped short of what God's called them to do and to be are going to always try to stop you when you step up to fight the battle. Did you get that? You're going to have to make your way through accusing voices, the voice of fear in your own heart, as well as demonic forces, and even voices in your own camp that want to dissuade you and discourage you from doing what you know the Holy Spirit's leading you to do and believe. You're going to hear things like, well, what have you accomplished? You know, what have you ever done to make such a boast? You've only been a keeper of a few sheep. I mean, you've only shared your testimony two or three times. In fact, you've never led anybody to the Lord, have you? I, I mean, I'm really not even sure you're saved. Hmm. You ever heard voices like that? Even Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, because you're but a youth. But he's a man of war from his youth. In other words, you're but a young new believer in the Lord. You can't really expect to do anything, can you? Let me say, every single one of us are young when we are compared to Satan. I mean, he's been developing his strategy since the beginning of time, and he's been planning, scheming, and all his minions and servants for a long time. And folks, we're no match for the natural. In the natural, we can't do it. No matter how many voices accused him, David insisted on going to fight the giant because he knew a great truth. He knew a great truth. God's holy word tells us in verse 5, God has scattered the bones of him that had camped against thee, Thou hast put them to shame. It takes a person who knows God, who's confident, and says confidently, as David said to Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David wasn't moved by the threats of the enemy, he wasn't moved by the voices around him. He knew God had already scattered those bones and it camped against him. It was already accomplished. He knew it. And while the armies of Israel stood paralyzed by fear and unbelief that day, David went into the battle with a heart full of faith, full of faith, declaring in 1 Samuel 17, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and Take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. David believed and trusted God, and he put his faith in the Lord God Almighty before he ever stepped into battle. We have to do that. You get that. I mean, I at once... When the Philistines saw that their champion Goliath was dead, they all took off. They fled. I'd ask ourselves this morning, just as a pause, do, what do we say about God in our own lives? What do we, not merely talking about an empty confession of words, but deep within your heart and soul, What's he able to do for you? I mean, will you and I believe him and what he said in his word and allow him to live his life in and through us? In our voices and in our actions, in a time when people around us are foolish to say, foolish enough to say there is no God. It's all around us today. I mean, it's so sad, but there are so-called churches today where the Lord Jesus Christ didn't even proclaim. It's just sitting on a stool telling story after story. Mm. 
it bothers them to read the truth that Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father by me, but by me. Amen. Now, they may believe the first part of that. But you get on to say, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Whoop, mm-mm, that's a horrible thing to say. Oh, it's too exclusive. Listen, folks, we need boldness today with fears that are all around us. And we can't remain silent. We cannot. We've got to speak the truth in great fear where no fear is. It's the power of God in us through the Holy Spirit of God who can help us not be paralyzed by fear. Turn over with me to Psalm 46. Let's look there. Psalm 46. Because this is the remedy. This is the answer that I'd call it. I'd call it a psalm to keep you from falling apart. And many believe that this psalm was written by King Hezekiah to commemorate God's great victory over Sennacherib. Uh, you can read that in 2 Kings 18 through 19 and Isaiah 36. But the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, thought he had Hezekiah caught in, in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. He had him trapped. That's what he thought. He, he was, I mean, good night. He, he couldn't make it. Hezekiah prayed, though. God spoke, and the enemy was defeated. That's the sum of it. And one night, 185,000 soldiers. Now, this psalm is divided into three declarations of faith based on the sufficiency of God. And each part is marked by the word selah. And you may be wondering, well, what, what's the meaning of selah? Well, nobody knows for certain. Many think that selah meant to pause or reflect. This could have been a request for the reader or listener to pause, to think about what they just, what's just been said. Or it could have been a space for the voices to pause for instruments to play along. We don't really know for certain. Regardless, the word selah itself, without a doubt, causes us to pause and consider what's been said, even when we don't fully understand. In simple words, it could be said there. There, what do you think of that? Selah gives us an opportunity to take a moment away from this crazy, busy, nonstop life we all tend to live and consider the immense mysteries and wonders of the Almighty God. Look with me at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. These first verses give us the first declaration that I'd like to look at. We will not fear because we have a refuge. The man who wrote Psalm 46 knew exactly what you might be going through today and me. He was in trouble. I mean, the Hebrew word trouble means in a tight place. The Old Testament has 21 Hebrew words for the word trouble. Everything was against him. I mean, the earth was shaking. The mountains were being carried into the sea. The sea was raging. Troubles on every side. Think about that. What's that musical? Trouble, trouble, trouble. I don't know. I asked my wife, where, where was that found? Anybody know? <laughs> There's trouble. At River City. Anyway. To an ancient Jew, the mountains were the most stable thing on the earth. Psalm 125.2 says it. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth forever. But the mountains were moving. They were shaken. Has the Lord for, forgotten his people? Is he forsaken them? Someone said that the crisis doesn't make a person. It reveals what he's made of. In a crisis, you turn to what you put your trust in. For example, I mean, I don't know, maybe an alcoholic turns to his bottle. If you're caught into that trap or you're somebody that's caught into the trap of, of addiction to drugs or some other form or something else, they turn to pills or needles or something else. But a Christian turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. God is our refuge and strength. I will not fear. I have a refuge. The word for refuge literally means a place 
to which we go quietly for protection. The mighty God of creation is our refuge, the one to whom we can go quietly for protection. For when any disaster, anything happens to our lives, it's in our way. Now, that's a wonderful thing to know because it's very personal, isn't it? It's very personal. Isaiah said in chapter 32, 2, And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as the river of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Who's that man? What man are we talking about? We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. God the Son. And believe me, he's there in the storm. And there is a storm coming. And for many, it's already here. The Lord Jesus Christ is our great rock in a weary land. And without a doubt, this land and world is very weary and desolate. And when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, you're going to find refuge and strength in him. You know that. And it's wonderful and it's true. We know Christ is our refuge to hide us and hold us and strengthen us and to help us. He didn't hide us to pamper us. No, no. He hides us to prepare us to go back and face the difficulties of this life. Too many times we want to we escape the challenges and the trials, don't we? I mean, it's just natural. When actually the trials are just what we need. God knows what we need. He knows better than we do. We don't run to the Lord to have him shelter us while others just carry all our burdens. No. We run to him for protection and provision, safety and strength so we can go back and give the glorious gospel and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and face those challenges and trials, whatever they are. Listen, we don't need to fear. Why? Because we have a refuge. The psalmist said in 143.9, Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. No matter the situation you're finding yourself in today, you can flee to the Lord by faith. He'll welcome you. He'll shelter you. He'll strengthen you. You say, ha, oh, you don't know my situation. Mm -mm, you don't know. I, the stresses I'm facing right now, I might lose my job. In fact, I'm in the process of it. I've got kids who need me, and I'm the provider. You don't know my health condition, how horrible it is. I've got this snickness, and it's not going away. I mean, is this hanging around? Oh, my. Oh, it's just things are just awful. I'm the provider. I, I, everything just goes a world around in my I know. I do know because I'm in the same boat as you are. The question is, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? We cry out to God. That's what we do. That's what we do. We flee to him. We hold on to him. We grab. How do you flee to God? By trusting in his promises, the promises in God's word. Look them up. I mean, God, get into God's word and take hold. Believe, trust, and stand on the promises of God. I love that song. In prayer. Even when in the land is an upheaval and earthquakes rip it apart, the sea sends massive tides and waves, angry waves. It's a way of telling us not to be afraid, not to fear. Can I say, can I say not to fear even insurrections and evasions, invasions, you know? Never fear, you say. Why? Because our refuge is safe. It's, it's safe no matter what comes because we know he's coming. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Amen? He is. Circumstances and feelings change all the time. But God never changes. He's our rock. He won't forsake us. Psalm 9 says the Lord also will be a refuge to the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hath not forsaken that it forsaken them that trust thee, that seek thee. Psalm 62, He is my rock and my salvation, He is my defense. I love that. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Listen, there's not a natural or national disaster that can touch the refuge, the strength we have in God, for Christ is our refuge. And the psalmist says, Selah, there. What do you think of that? What is it that's tearing you apart right now? What is it that's worrying us, making us hard to sleep, hard to settle down, to say anything? Listen, 
Take courage. God hadn't changed. He hasn't changed. There. What do you think of that? We will not fear because we have a refuge. But the next declaration, we will not faint because we have a river. In verses 4 through 7, there's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen, Gentile nations, raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Did you know that Jerusalem, and I believe you did, we've talked about it, is one of the few ancient cities that's not built on a river. I mean, Rome was built on the Tiber, Babylon on the Euphrates, Nineveh on the Tigris, all the great cities in Egypt depended on the Nile River. Ancient cities needed water close at hand, especially during a siege. Or when Sennacherib attacked Jerusalem, he was sure their lack of water would just drive them to surrender. The enemy didn't have a clue, did he? That godly and wise King Hezekiah had built an underground water system. Yeah, archaeologists discovered it. And if I'm not mistaken, you can wade through that water in the underground tunnel of Jerusalem today. The system is 1,777 feet long, and it connects the spring of Gihon to the pool of Siloam. And the enemy didn't know a thing about that. And that, that was their unfailing source, Jerusalem's unfailing source of refreshment without, without which the city couldn't have lasted one or two months. God shall help her and that right early, writes the psalmist. It's in the morning, that right early. That's exactly when God delivered Hezekiah. You can read about that in Isaiah 37, 36. You know, without that hidden river, Jerusalem would have fallen not from the strength of the enemy outside without it, but from the weakness and the failure within. Instead, the city had that secret river that kept it strong. Yeah, Hezekiah and his people had that marvelous river, but you know what? They had a greater river than that. They had the supernatural resources of the Lord God Almighty. The scripture says God is in the midst of her. There's, she shall not be moved. That's what it says. There was someone in the midst. God is in the midst of her, it says. And we know who that is, don't we? He takes his place in the midst of his believing people. He does. We see him in the midst of the temple as a boy at 12. We see him in the midst of the upper room after the resurrection. We see him in the midst of the lampstands walking among the seven churches in Revelation. We see him in the midst of the four and twenty elders in glory. He's always in the midst. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He's in the midst when we as God's people gather together today. And he was in the midst when the cruel Assyrians threatened the city of Jerusalem without. The psalmist says in verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. And we, when we drink of him, we find that he gives us strength that we need at the very moment we need it. The word with us, among you. And from that, we get the great messianic title, Emmanuel, God with us. Listen, the enemy was defeated before he ever left Assyria. I want to encourage you this morning. Just think of that marvelous river we have within us all. In this Bible, in this Bible, God the, God the Father is revealed as a fountain of living water. Jeremiah, when he rebuked the backslidings of Israel, records this sad word from God in the second chapter. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, we're told in the scripture is a well of living water. Speaking to the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up 
unto everlasting life. Amen. And God the Holy Spirit hmm, set before us as a river of living water. On that last day, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and called to the person, people there in John 7, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Listen, think about it. Think about it. We have that marvelous river within us. The Holy Spirit of God has come down from the throne of God to fill the heart and soul of every born-again child of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit to provide us a deep, unending resource and reservoir of spiritual supply. That is absolutely fantastic. I'm telling you, no enemy can stop him from flowing us through us and in us. None. Can't happen. The rivers flow from him and they flow through us to bless others. So me, you, and every one of us provide for us. He gives us what we need. And I praise God. We need to remember that when things Go wrong when things are happening around us. Let's not forget what Jesus said. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Just as the water flowed out of that rock when Moses struck it, so the Holy Spirit in his fullness flows from Christ who died for us and rose again. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, all of nature depends on the hidden resources, just like trees send their roots deep into the earth to find hidden resources streams of water so you and I can sink our spiritual roots in the streams of God's spiritual power in Christ because he's the vine and we're what? The branches. And it's he who keeps us from fainting with fear. Psalm 1 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit and his season, his leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Did any of you know who J. Hudson Taylor was? J. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China, and he founded the China Inland Mission in 1865. His biography records an incident that shows his utter dependence upon God. He and one of his associates, they were opening the mail, as they do, and each letter told of horrible bad news. I mean, there were uprisings going on that threatened the safety of his workers, of all the workers at that mission. And everyone seemed to, everything just seemed to be falling apart. And Taylor's associates started to leave a room thinking he wanted to be alone uh, as he did. And he, as he was leaving, he heard a strange sound. Taylor was whistling his favorite hymn. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I'm finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Mm. His friend asked, how can you whistle when our friends are in such great danger and peril? Taylor said, well, would you happen to be to be anxious and troubled, brother? I mean, that wouldn't help him. And it certainly incapacitate me from my work. I have just to roll the burden on the Lord. And that saint of God drank deeply of the hidden spiritual river. That that gave him peace that passeth all understanding. Oh, my, in all the hour of testing and trial he was going through, he didn't fear or faint because he had a river. It's wonderful to know that, isn't it, that the Lord Jesus Christ has come to take up his residence in our hearts? Hallelujah. I mean, so we can shout, Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. There. What do you think of that? Hmm. Let's move on to the conclusion of this encouraging psalm. Poem of praise. The psalmist gives a challenge of all mankind in general and to the Lord's people in particular. We've already seen the truth. We won't fear because we have a refuge. We won't faint because we have a river. In the last declaration, we will not fret because we have a revelation. What's that revelation? Well, let's take a look at verse 8 and 9. Come behold the works of the Lord... What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease and to the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder and burneth the chariot in fire. We're called to behold the works of the Lord. There's a past, present, and prophetic applications here. And the psalmist looks forward to the day, this psalm looks forward to the day, when Jesus is going to come destroy all the armies 
at the Battle of Armageddon. All the armies of the world. He's going to turn swords into plowshares, plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. That's prophetic. But there's also a past application. As clear as can be, as the psalmist declares how God looked down one morning at the battlements of Jerusalem and how he saw all the dead of the Syrian army that came against him, God's people. Right here, come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. What about present application today? Well, we know as the scriptures told us that we're, we're engaged right now in a deadly struggle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that so many of the problems that people face today, and even Christians, it's a spiritual battle, folks. We're in one right now. And Satan and his minions want not only to destroy you, but to destroy your children. And the governments of this world, including our own, are so far gone the way of sin, moving toward destruction. The Bible said it'd be this way. They're out to destroy families, homes, the very fabric of a decent, moral, upright society. And the devil and his minions have done it all by the installment plan, little by little, and the devil knows its time is short. But we know our God is returning very soon, amen. And until then, I thank God we can claim the victory at Calvary and the power and the blood, and we're able to engage and live in a victorious Christian life and spiritual warfare that the Apostle Paul described for us in Ephesians 6. I ask you, is there anything greater than knowing the Lord God and having Him fight your battles? I say no. There's not a thing. There's no need to fret or fear. He is God. Fretting and falling into the temptation of fear is a common thing for all of us. I mean, we get impatient with other people, don't we? We get impatient with God, even with ourselves, and we get nervous about things, can't sleep or do our work well, and we try to convince ourselves and our friends that we're not really fretting. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fearful. I'm just concerned and burdened. Hmm. We say, but God knows, and we know it's just plain, flat dab worry is what it is, and the word translated fret not comes from the meaning to be hot, to be angry. When you and I are worried, we become nervous and fretful, don't we? I mean, we're like a lid on a pot of boiling water. And our English word for fret comes in an old word that means to eat up, to consume. Fretting eats us up. It consumes our peace and joy and robs us of the blessings of God. We've got to remember that there's no need to fret. There's no need to fear because you're in Christ. He'll never leave nor forsake you. Yes, it may sometimes feel like he's nowhere near, but he's there. Remember, his promises said, the Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts means army. Hosts means armies. The Lord of armies is with us. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us. He lives in us, through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. If God be for us, who can be against us? We're told in Romans 8. And we're told in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. Don't worry. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus. We're promised the peace of God that passes all understanding. I didn't understand it 12 years ago. I didn't. When my dear wife was diagnosed with stage 4 colorectal cancer that metastasized to her liver, I mean, I didn't know what was going on. All we could do was take it to the Lord. And listen to him in his word, to be still and to trust him and know that he is God. We trusted that he'd bring us the peace we needed at that moment, that hour, no matter what happened. He did. He did. Jesus Christ was our peace, and he is our peace now. I can't explain it, but that's what he did. That's what he did, even when she was near death. God had a plan. So what are we to do? We're to look at these last two verses of Psalm 46 and we'll be done. Write them down deep into your heart and soul as we determine that we're going we're gonna to live and believe the truth that we're told. Be still and know that I'm God. Now listen, we're going to have a hard time getting to know God if we're, and have fellowship with Him. We're buzzing here and there and so many things pulling us in every direction. Someone said we mutter and we sputter, we fume and we spurt, we mumble and grumble, our feelings get hurt. We don't understand things and our vision grows dim when what we needed was a moment with him. We've got to learn to say no to some demands that are made upon us in the right order of priority. 
God first, family second, church third. Now, this can cover a lot of ground. I mean, are we going to obey God and what we know and believe in His Word? Or are we going to listen to the lies of this world and Satan's agenda that's constantly telling you what to believe? You know, one of Satan's traps is to get you so involved in some kind of activity that we've got no time to be still in the presence of God. Be still and know that I'm God. Why? So we don't find ourselves fretting. It's true. Sometimes he has to force us to be still. And trials come not just from without but from within. So why? We don't want to find ourselves fretting. Be still means take your hands off. Take your hands off. Don't get, I'm God. I can handle any situation. I know what's best for you better than you do. Wait on me. Be still. And so when Hezekiah got that threatening letter, what did he do? He went out and spread it before the Lord. He spread it before the Lord. He sought the Lord. He asked God to help him and his people. And he took his hands off the problem. He waited on God and God took over without hustling and bustling and trying to do the work in, God, in man's way. Sometimes we get to thinking we can figure it all out. We can't. It's just so difficult for us to wait on God and let him move in his way, in his time. And so we start trying to finagle and finagle our way out of the mess instead of first taking it to the Lord in prayer. Faith is living without scheming. Back at 2.20 says, But the Lord in his holy temple let all the earth keep silent before him. Stop our frantic trying. Start trusting the one who can't calm the seas. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. That's God's plan. Oh, he's not going to let any enemy win. No way. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's the last verse. Oh, the last. It just All of this means that our redemption draweth nigh, folks. Think of it. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Almighty Lord, Almighty Lord God. I, listen, the good news is better than, than anything we can imagine. It doesn't say, it doesn't say the host of, are with us. It says the Lord of hosts is with us. That's God himself. God himself. He's with us. He's with me in my loneliness. He's with me in my weakness. He's with me when I'm trying to give a testimony to somebody that doesn't want to hear. He's with me in a word that's gone, in a world that's gone absolutely mad out of its mind. He's with me despite my failures, my sins, my faults. God is with me. So there are the three great declarations that keep us from falling apart when life and things we face become so hard and difficult because we know and trust the Lord, we can say, I will not fear. I have a refuge. I will not faint. I have a river. I will not fret. I have a revelation. He is God. God says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Are we worthy of such help? No, of course not. But God does help because, not because we're worthy. He helps us in our time of need because he's gracious. And he's worthy. And if we're in Christ, we're covered by his righteousness, praise the Lord. He's the God of Jacob. Do you think Jacob was worthy of all he, all God did for him? No. If the psalmist had written the God of Abraham is our refuge, we'd be discouraged. Because Abraham was a great man of faith. Jacob, the supplanter. The backsliding sins and failures that he was dealing with. He was honest with God and himself at that brook of Jabbok. And it was there God took that deceitful shepherd into his loving arms and he changed his name to Israel, Prince of God. That's what God does with us. When we submit and surrender our life and will by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes... We can trust him in all things because the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. You know, if Sennacherib had known that, I think he would have kept his armies at home. Selah, what do you think of that? Father, I thank you for the lesson today. I do pray and thank you that this has been a help to someone and that you'll take it and use it for your glory, Lord.
and your purpose. Now be with us by your spirit in the coming service and anoint the singing and preaching of your word. Give us receptive hearts to hear it in Jesus' name. Amen.